Welcome to Truflation Twitter Spaces pre-FOMC meeting and Chair Powell press conference. Will the Fed raise rates? Our panel this episode include the Truflation team. We're honored to have guest speakers Joseph Tracy, Senior Advisor to the Dallas Fed President, Omar Yahia of ZK Sync and Matter Labs, and Alan Lauch of Generation Blue Marketplace. Um, we are recording, of course, so please keep that in mind uh, for posterity here. And we also archive all of our um, Twitter spaces up on YouTube. Uh, some housekeeping as well. Um, basically, after the panel weighs in, we always open it up to listener questions. If you'd rather not speak, simply tweet at us, at Truflation, and we'll pose your question to the panel. You're listening to Truflation.com Fed Analysis, sponsored by Truflation Premium, our comprehensive data service for investors, businesses, and those who wish to stay in the know. Uh, introductory prices will not last too much longer, uh, so surf over to Truflation.com and click the black download data button to order yours today. After 10 straight hikes since March of 2022, Will there be a Fed hike announced today at 2 p.m. Eastern from D.C., or will there be an expected hawkish pause? Nearly every major investment bank is predicting some kind of skip, with only City suggesting uh, a dovish hike of 0.25, and that pretty much matches our internal poll of followers, who 75% of whom, I think we had roughly 1,000, uh, participate uh, overnight. Uh, 75% are saying there will be no hike with a so truflation 25% uh, giving the counter signal here, which is uh, which is great to see. Um, some of the investment banks in TradFi, Bank of America, Barclays, Deutsche, Goldman, JP Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, Nomura, Nomura rather, uh, Wells Fargo, all are saying pause. Again, City is the lone holdout in that Um Survey complicating matters is the official CPI released uh, by BLS yesterday, putting inflation at exactly 4% uh, for May with core higher, uh, st a little stickier above 5 Also overnight, the Truflation daily CPI dropped 0.20% to uh, 2.54, and that's for sure going to raise some eyebrows inside the Eccles uh, building today. Um, hang tight while I Cue some people in here and get our speakers um, rolling. Uh, again, we've got a terrific panel, and we're excited for you to hear from them uh, today. Um, let's see here. Trying to get them all in. And it looks like if you wouldn't mind muting yourself. And let's see here. I think I've got everybody. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, yeah, I think it looks good. Um, we'll start off with uh, our CEO of uh, Truflation, <coughs> and that would be um, Stefan Rust. Um, wow, it feels like we, we just did this, uh, Stefan. Uh, a couple days ago, <laughs> uh, how are you feeling now? What's what's your take? And um, with all these these podcasts and and media hits that we're doing, I think the question that kind of rarely gets asked, uh, but maybe you can uh, help us with, is how does the average listener use the information we're about to impart? Well, I guess you can always hedge yourself against the market and anticipation. So one example, of course, is if the inflation rate meets the outcome and the decision of the FOMC meets market expectations, then the prices in the markets are likely to stay pretty stable because the expectation is being met and that is likely to be built into a large portion of the prices. In the event that it is above and below, markets will react accordingly in surprise. Um, I think this time around, 
the market is anticipating zero interest rate hike. Um, and as a result, you know, if that does happen, then um, ultimately it met market expectations, pricing will have been built in, and we won't see too much of a sway in the event they raise interest rates by 25 basis points, I think you will see the markets drop significantly and vice versa if they reduce interest rates, which I think a large portion of the market sees unlikely, um, you will see the markets go up significantly because again, that's against expectations. Anyway, all these factors play in. Those are not investment advice, obviously. It's just uh, um, what I think one can expect. Um, yesterday's inflation numbers were really good in terms of a huge drop. So the tightening of liquidity in the market has resulted in significant price drops um, around the world, resulting uh, in not necessarily it, a disinflation. So prices are rising at a much slower rate is what that means. So it's not that prices are dropping. Uh, it actually means that prices are rising a lot slower than they pre were previously. Yeah, that's an important distinction to make. And it's one that our followers often make, uh, that it's a slow um, or slowing in the, in the rise of inflation, not necessarily uh, the drop that uh, everybody uh, would would want. Um, that's kind of a nice segue into um, our guest speaker before we get into uh, heavy analysis uh, from our head of product, Oliver Roost. Um, Want to welcome um, to the chat here uh, Joseph Tracy, a senior advisor to the president of the Dallas Fed. Um, Joseph. You're, you know, kind of at least more privy than we are to uh, the sausage making of something like the FOMC. Um, what's your, what's your, well, first off, thank you for, for coming on. And what's your general sense of, of what the Fed uh, might propose today? Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, great to be on. Let me just uh, make one point, which is that I actually retired from the Dallas Fed back in August. So my comments today obviously don't reflect the views. Of the sure. Fed. Congratulations, by the yes, way. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I think the uh, the Fed is in a, a, a tough position. Uh, this is exactly where in the monetary policy cycle, the Fed would like to be heavily relying on its forecast of inflation and not simply the most recent data on an inflation, but unfortunately, uh, its credibility around its inflation forecast was damaged by its earlier insistence that inflation was going to be transitory. Uh, I think the other thing that concerns me a little bit is um, we would like to have an independent monetary policy, meaning that the Fed is always going to be making its rate decisions based on what it feels is most appropriate to bring inflation back to target. But there are now two other concerns that may be uh, weighing in on the Fed's decision. One is whether or not further rate increases might create more instability in financial markets. Um, and this is the problem they've been facing with the inverted yield curve and its impact on small and medium banks. That's unfortunate because prudential and macro prudential supervision should have been able to take care of these issues uh, to uh, allow the Fed to continue to exercise kind of an independent monetary policy. The other is that we have an election year coming up next year. And even though the Fed is politically mm -hmm. independent, it is very aware that a recession and the second half of this year or first half of next year could be quite consequential uh, for the election. And so uh, that may also weigh on their thinking. Uh, and so these, these are some complications that affect their decision. But I think the final thing I'll say just uh, as introductory remarks is that whether they move 25 basis points uh, today or not is not as material, I think, as looking at what they say their forecasts are going to be for uh, policy rates to the rest of this year and into 2024. And this will come out with the new survey of economic projections. 
And this is where I think it's important to see where they think rates are going to be ending up at the end of 23 and whether or not uh, members are uh, expecting to cut rates in 24. So that's what I will be focusing on is if there are any material changes in that survey from the last one in March. Excellent. And you're listening to Trueflation.com Twitter Spaces uh, for an FOMC um, Fed rate hike um, uh, possible or possibility rather. Um, that was uh, Joseph Tracy, um, former um, senior advisor to the Dallas Fed. And uh, we'll uh, shoot back to him in just a minute uh, with his opening remarks there. Um, on to our head of product, uh, Oliver Roos. Um, you know, you've also had a heck of a week. I've, I've seen that you've gotten a lot of media calls uh, for analysis. You're doing podcasts, <laughs> our Twitter spaces on top of your regular work. Um, what's your sense of things? Uh, what, what do you expect uh, to, uh, uh, to happen today? Yeah, well, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I, I definitely echo the comments by uh, Joseph and by Stefan. I think the, the market expectation is that the interest rates are going to be held at 5% at the current rates. Um, I think if you look at the numbers a bit more difficult, a bit more deeper, I think that some of the drivers of that are showing some mixed results, right? So um, if you look at some of the, the prices market, um, you're certainly seeing not only the BLS and their CPI projection coming downwards, it's now hit the lowest of 4%. Uh, it's been hitting a downward trajectory month on month for the last uh, four months. Uh, <clears throat> I think the other numbers that that has shown a bit of a, and what the Federals relies on showed a bit of a, a um, uh, an odd direction is the PCE numbers, uh, especially last month, which saw an increase in that PCE number. Um, so that would give certainly give the models uh, that, that Joseph spoke about that the, that the Fed would be relying on a bit of a, a challenge in there. Certainly expected to come down again, um, but that upward trajectory last month certainly had a, uh, had a few kinks in it. And then, of course, you got the PPI, right, which is the producer's price index. Um, that has seen a decline, which is also great. And it's been hovering around as, you know, uh, pretty stable levels the last you know, six months. Um, but uh, the one interesting factor, and across all the data sets, including what Trueflation is seeing in their own data, is that the, the sort of input costs into... Um, into the pricing uh, is driven, is coming down for the production of goods, whereas the labor market is still remaining tight, right? Wage inflation is still high. Um, unemployment, yeah, it's peak, it's gone up a bit from 3.4 to 3.7, but the wage inflation is still hovering around 5.5%. Jobless claims, yeah, relatively stable this month, looking at the last four weeks, but yeah, going an upward trajectory. But that labor market is still relatively hot, uh, the prices seem to be coming down, and they're driven in part by the, the cost of goods. So basically what we're seeing is, yeah, I think the goods element are starting to come down, and we're moving away from a, a supply-driven inf uh, inflationary market into a demand-driven inflationary market. And then I think the secondary factor is the labor market remains hot, and so therefore all the price of services are still strong. Um, and the final point I'd say that where the Fed is also going to deal with is not is also the um, purchasing power, which seems to be on the rise, right? And the first time in a long time, we have seen inflation and wage increases now at 5.5%, and now uh, inflation at 4%. So you're seeing an increase of, of uh, purchasing power, which, uh, you know, with the job market the way it is, uh, means we're certainly not out of the woods yet. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's, uh, that's well put. Uh, if you're just joining us, uh, we are talking about the Fed and the FOMC gathered um, in D.C. today and what they may be doing. Kind of a read of the of the tea leaves, as it were. We are joined by Joseph Tracy, former advisor uh, to the Dallas uh, Fed president, um, Oliver Rust, who you just heard, head of product at Trueflation, uh, CEO Stefan Rust of uh, Trueflation. And I'm going to bring in now uh, a businessman, uh, a businessman, Omar Yahia of Matter Labs and ZK Sync. Um, you've had the sort of the uh, the catbird seat listening to all the commentary, Omar. 
Uh, what's your what's your general feeling? Are you going to buck the trend here and say they're going to raise rates, or or uh, how do you uh, how do you feel about what may occur today? Uh, great, thanks for having me, and uh, it's it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I did actually once approach this from uh, a slightly different angle and ask whether it means anything to use the same set of tools that the Fed has been using for quite some time when it's very clear that both the uh, market structure and the uh, inflation environment are sort of profoundly different from where we were in pre-2018, pre-2020, post-2020, and then certainly post-2022 uh, with the war um, um, in the East. Uh, I was, uh, in fact, just reading some commentary by uh, Mohamed Larien, uh, and he was um, asking the, a, a very similar question. He was saying, I wonder whether it means anything to target a nominal rate that was decided ex ante before any of this uh, sort of happened, and then use the same uh, tools that the Fed has been using uh, for, the, for the past decade to try and reach an, uh, a sort of quasi-equilibrium level. And the, the, the reason why I think it's a, it's a relevant question is because everybody now is wondering, should the Fed pause? Are they really data-driven? Does it mean anything to pause? Because if you're certainly data driven, then having one month of pausing does nothing. It, it, from a statistical perspective, it, it basically doesn't inform you of anything. Um, and, and how does that affect your, uh, uh, your market operations? We know for, for quite some time now, the, Fed, uh, the Fed's main tool for open market operations has really been uh, open mouth operations, right? This, they they sort of project uh, a certain outlook onto the market and it's self-fulfilling. So this is more a question towards a uh, direct towards Joseph, uh, who certainly has a, a lot of experience in this. Um, but I, I, uh, I do, I do uh, think that in targeting a nominal rate in a way that's uh, very heavy handed, uh, and by heavy handed, I just mean by withdrawing uh, severe amounts of liquidity from the market, in addition to what we know the Treasury now has to do by the end of the year uh, to top up what's almost eight hundred uh, billion dollars worth of liquidity in order to replenish that pool for fiscal spending. Uh, I wonder if this is um, time to rethink this paradigm of uh, targeting a two and a half percent inflation rate. Yeah, Joseph, I'll, I'll let you uh, take that. Um, great question. And that does seem to be uh, the tension um, from the tech side anyway, uh, that you have a hundred year old institution um, trying to, you know, and you, you sort of spoke to this with regard to politics and so on in your introductory remarks. But uh, what uh, uh, what what do you say to uh, Omar's um, um, contention there? A uh, very important point. Um so the the goals for the uh, Fed are given to it by Congress, but only in quali uh, sort of qualitative terms. Uh, so the Fed has a dual mandate, different from many other central banks, which is stable prices, so keeping inflation low and predictable, but also maximum sustainable employment. Neither one were defined explicitly uh, by Congress. In 2012, the Fed did adopt uh, a specific inflation measure, as you uh, indicated, PCE inflation, and then decided that uh, it would interpret the stable price mandate as 2%. There was a lot of debate and research at the time whether or not 2% was the right choice. Uh, and also, uh, what exactly did the Fed mean by 2%? And over time, I, I think there was some view that uh, the Fed might view 2% as like a ceiling, so it would very aggressively try to resist inflation going above it. Uh, in August of 2020, it came out with a new framework which said, no, we're going to try to do this flexible average inflation targeting. And so if inflation has been below the target, we'll allow it to go above the target. That seemed ill-timed in retrospect, given what was going on with COVID. Uh, but there's, you know, there's debate as to whether or not uh, two percent was the right choice, uh, or whether or not the Fed should have adopted more of an interval. Like uh, we would be happy to try to keep inflation between, say, two and three uh, percent. Now, the challenge prior to COVID was that the Fed was consistently missing its target on the low side, and I think that's why it came out with that new framework. Uh, 
And what is now, I think the important question is, obviously, the Fed rolled out its standard playbook uh, in response to COVID and tried to attack the problem the same way it did following the financial crisis. But this was a very different type of situation, uh, starting much more with, as you said, a big supply shock uh, to the economy. And uh, I think the Fed also failed to recognize the much more aggressive fiscal response to COVID uh, than the fiscal response to the financial crisis. And this really left it a, a little bit flat footed and very slow uh, to respond. So it didn't even raise rates initially off of zero until March of 2022. We, at the Dallas Fed, we had been arguing back in the summer of 2021 that the labor markets are quite tight. The Fed should start to remove accommodation, but that its new framework that it announced said that as long as inflation was not above target, it would no longer preemptively raise rates because of tight labor markets. And I think that was probably a mistake as well. The final thing to note is that, um, you know, the Fed's policy rate is a very it's an overnight interest rate. And you might say, how does that really affect the economy or, or inflation even in the long run? And it only does it through its impact on financial conditions. And the challenge that I think the Fed has been in, particularly uh, uh, during this uh, cycle of removing accommodation, is that uh, the market, at least a segment of the market, has not believed the Fed's communications. And so the Fed has talked about having to raise rates and keep rates you know, higher or longer in order to bring inflation down. And the market keeps pricing in that the uh, Fed is going to have to uh, aggressively cut rates at either the end of this year or next year. And that led to this very steep inversion of the yield curve. And so normally, yeah, forward guidance was something that the Fed started using during the financial crisis when rates were at zero. But it hasn't worked as well this cycle because uh, there, again, is a bit of a credibility problem uh, between the markets and the Fed. And so, ironically, uh, keeping rates uh, flat at this meeting might actually lead uh, to some tightening of financial conditions where a uh, further increase in rates might cause some of these market participants to say, oh, the Fed's just compounding its mistake and we're certainly going to you know get into a recession in the year and the fed will have to back off and so um the link between the policy rate and financial conditions uh has been weakened this cycle and i think that's a challenge as well for the fed <laughs> one go no. sorry just one question if i have maybe to the, the just overall all of us here you know it's like one of the philosophies in the past has usually been, how can I shock the market to bring it um, more in line and, and then withdraw liquidity out of the market versus the continuous increase of interest rates at 25 basis points over a cycle of 10 consecutive meetings? Wouldn't it have been, I mean, hindsight's always 2020, but would it, how would have the, how in your interpretations would the market have reacted had we done you know, one, two, you know, one to 200 basis point hikes in one go, and then nothing for, you know, to your point, Omar, where you mentioned, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, just how do I, how would the market react in, in an event like that versus just this steady, easy, that doesn't really have an impact that much over the course of the next one, two quarters, but it will have a, a later impact. Whereas if you do a big increase, it will have a far greater and, and, and deeper impact and a lot more sudden. So this was a, a, in, in looking back at sort of former uh, rate cycles, this has been, a, I guess, a fairly aggressive rate cycle, but not as aggressive as you just described. I think the theory was that uh, if the Fed clearly communicates where it intends to take its policy rate in the future, uh, the market will go ahead and, if they believe the Fed, will go ahead and reprice ahead of the actual increases by the Fed. And so even if the Fed is, you know, um, back in, in Greenspan, the measured pace, 25 basis points, that was less important than the market understanding where the Fed was going, because then it would just move up that in terms of pricing. So uh, the challenge this time, as I mentioned, is that I think there's been some disagreement between segments of the market and the Fed over 
what the course of policy was going to have to be. Uh, in terms of why not just go ahead and, you know, take, you know, yank the Band-Aid, take your, you know, just raise interest rates a couple hundred basis points. I think the view is that would be operationally very disruptive to markets. And it's much better to go ahead and space those out. But it, you need to really uh, convince the market where you're going so they can start pricing in the, the longer rates. Um, so th- that's at least, uh, I think, the the theory behind why the actual rate increases uh, are spaced out over a cycle. Well, speaking of, uh, of uh, Alan Greenspan, this is a, a topic that's, that's come up recently over and over. I think in the, in the Volcker era, in the Greenspan era, and even in the Ben Bernanke era, um, the, the Fed would typically take a very strong view directionally, at least, um, um, in terms of the economy and the market. Uh, in the case of Jerome Powell, do you think he is a little bit more hesitant to take such uh, directional views? Uh, based on the forward guidance, there's always this uh, jittery feeling that uh, the policy could be reversed uh, uh, any, you know, any given Sunday. And we've seen that uh, happen in 2018, of course, um, uh, with the uh, overnight repo uh, problem. Um, or is that not a fair assessment, do you think, Joseph? Well, I yeah, I, I think some have um, have expressed concern that that Jay sometimes has kind of moved back and forth in terms of uh, particular stances for the committee. Some of that, uh, you know, again, um, to give Jay credit, it, you know, managing it depends a lot on the makeup of the committee. And if the committee is pretty united in terms of its view, then it's much easier for the chair to project uh, a consistent sort of outlook for the committee. If there you know, are divisions within the committee, then he has to manage that. And certainly in a, a period uh, you know, like after the financial crisis and then the, the COVID health crisis, uh, I think chairs want to uh, project to uh, the business community that the committee is you know, united. Uh, on a particular view and to try to avoid dissents and that can, you know, lead to a complicated negotiation process between the chair uh, and uh, the various other uh, participants on the FOMC. I do feel though that in, uh, in, in some cases, I think Jay was underplaying what the challenges might be. So I think it did not help that early on, well, first of all, this this view that it was largely just these temporary supply shocks, they underestimated how long it was going to take for that to repair itself. And I agree that a lot of the reduction we've seen in inflation to date is probably reflecting that that driver has largely uh, been resolved. Um, but Jay kept uh, stressing this idea of engineering a soft landing. Uh, and kind of backpedaling that to get inflation down uh, back to 2%, there is a high probability that the economy is going to have to go through uh, a recession. And I think it would have been better if he had just sort of told the public, this is certainly uh, the risk because we have very few soft landings uh, in our history and prepare people that uh, the committee is willing to do this. It, it's important enough uh, to get inflation down that if this is what it takes. So I think a lot of people were wondering whether or not he would really uh, risk a, a recession if that's what it uh, took to get inflation down. And now, of course, as I mentioned, we're right on the heels of an important uh, election. That is just going to come back, I think, uh, to cause people to say he won't risk it. And this is where you start worrying, I think, if you're trying to decide what, what is inflation going to be in the future, uh, is the committee really committed over this next year to get inflation down, or are other considerations going to compromise its decision-making for a period of time? Uh, with You're listening to Truflation Twitter Spaces. We are discussing whether the Fed will raise uh, rates today, and uh, I think a little deeper analysis of uh, really understanding the mechanisms of the FOMC. Uh, we are honored to have uh, guest speakers, Omar Yahia of ZK Sinks and uh, Matter Labs. 
and of course, uh, Joseph Tracy, former advisor to the Dallas uh, Federal Reserve president, um, kind of piggybacking off of uh, Omar here. Um, you know, let's, I don't, you know, you, Joseph, you don't need to be um, a psychoanalyst, but looking at, say, that, because as soon as uh, Omar said uh, or mentioned uh, Paul Volcker, I, I, I often wonder if there's a Volcker like personality within those 12. Uh, 12 banks. Um, I, I don't think we'll see a, a chair like him um, ever again, but uh, interesting, you know, guy, uh, very bold and brash. Uh, that contrasts at least popularly uh, with um, our, our last two uh, um, Fed chairs in terms of Jan- Janet Yellen um, and, uh, and Jay Powell. Um, it, I'm not sure what I'm asking. Uh, is, is, and you sort of spoke to it already a little bit, but is there a Volcker uh, in the group, and how would you sort of compare uh, Yellen and Powell in terms of their temperament? They seem roughly the same, at least from the outside. Well, as I commented earlier, um, the Fed was just, was designed with lots of political independence, so we have budgetary independence. Um, the uh, while the governors are uh, political appointees, the twelve Reserve Bank presidents uh, are appointed by their boards of directors, five of which uh, are on the FOMC on any cycle. Uh, and all of this is, I think, based on the view that it, it is important for to have a central bank that makes decisions independent of any political cycle or considerations. But it takes a very strong personality, even with this kind of designed in independence to resist uh, the the normal political pressures that come uh, along with the job and every chair is exposed to them. I think what is really important uh, maybe as a qualification for a chair is they don't want the job too badly. They'll do whatever (laughs) it takes um, as opposed to worrying about getting renominated for the position. And I think Volcker was, a good example of someone who um, it was uh, we're going to do we're going to have the Fed do what it has to do and it's not going to be pretty and I grew up in the Midwest lots of uh, farmers and you know there were there, there was not a lot of love for Volcker at the time uh, there because it was those high interest rates were putting farms out of business but you know he didn't buckle down from from that and the concern is whether or not some of our recent uh, chairs have, have had that same sort of um, character or demeanor that they're going to really ignore any of the political pressure and basically, you know, lead the committee to do what it has to do that's best in the long term. Yeah, did you, did you get a chance to see uh, the exchange back in March between uh, Senator Kennedy from Louisiana and Jay Powell uh, during his testimony where uh, Senator Kennedy kind of just lovingly leads him in, uh, leads Powell into the conclusion that, uh, you know, something's got to give here in terms of raising rates and the Fed mandates um, and, and unemployment. Um, did you did you get a chance, uh, Joseph, to, to see that exchange or hear it? No, I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Um, we we published it uh, just a few days ago to kind of remind listeners, but. Uh, Kennedy's contention was that, you know, and he 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 openly said, uh, kind of in a Cheshire Cat way, I'm not trying to trick you, uh, to Powell, and I don't want you to get something. I, I don't want to get you to say something you don't want to say. But essentially, he was he was saying that there is a a real choice that as you raise rates, uh, we can expect the unemployment rate to rise uh, x amount, y amount, and he was using numbers like seven percent unemployment all the way up to ten percent. Uh, which got Jay's uh, eyes to bug out a little bit. But ultimately, um, I think uh, Powell just sort of acceded uh, to the idea that, yeah, there are trade-offs. Um, and you were talking politically, uh, which I, I appreciate. That's a very candid uh, thing to hear. And I can't imagine the, the pressures that the Fed feels uh, in that regard. But um, is it, it, well, just to take the completely devil's advocate view here, um, which I, I'm sure is not going to be popular. I mean, has the Fed done a decent job of late? Because I mean, with all these rate hikes, 
unemployment doesn't seem to be out of control in the way that I'm suggesting uh, Senator Kennedy said was just sort of automatic and, you know, mechanistic that it will happen. I mean, unemployment is still not great, but um, there's, there's, I don't know. I, I, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it to you to kind of uh, figure out whether I've asked the question, Joseph. <laughs> Well, well, to put it in perspective, um, we mentioned, that, and again, um, the Fed should be thinking about where inflation is going. And so it tends to use different core measures of inflation. Uh, now, the traditional ex food and energy uh, PCE core, I believe in April, was like 4.7. Uh, now, the Dallas uh, economist came up with a different core measure saying, well, ex food and energy are not always the most volatile components. So they came up with a trim mean that is always trying to take out the high frequency uh, inflation movements. Uh, and they found that uh, their trim mean was uh, more predictive of where inflation was going in the future than the traditional core. But that was at 4.8. Now, that, co that stands in contrast to uh, Truflation's measure, but if you take that 4.7 or 4.8 and you look at where the policy rate is, that's a, that's a very small nominal positive rate. And most people think that the real short-term rate is probably around a half percent, although some think that it may have even risen from that. So that's telling you that despite this, this very dramatic increase in rates, Really, um, policies, monetary policy is back more neutral. Uh, now, we should also factor in that the Fed is unwinding its balance sheet, so that would add a little more restraint. But it's not as if these uh, rate increases have pushed the policy rate well above the inflation rate. And so that's probably all, that and, and the significant amount of savings uh, that the household sector accumulated from the fiscal policy this is probably why the economy is held up this long, although those things are going to be dissipating. So the, the savings is going down. Despite the real wage increases, the majority of uh, workers are seeing their real wages decline. Uh, and so that's why I expect we'll see the economy to continue to slow as we get into the second half of the year. And just historically, it's very hard to have the unemployment rate increase by, say, you know, a half a percent or a percent and stop. So when we get these reversals in the unemployment rate uh, of any magnitude, then it typically goes up quite significantly because the economy tips into a recession. So that was probably, I think, the basis for uh, that question and answer with the chair. Well, you all, you've got a real chance here to talk with a stellar panel. Um, we love your questions. Uh, you see that little heart uh, with a plus sign there, you can raise your hand um, and ask to speak. Uh, we'll bring you to the front of the line. Um, you can ask a question of the panel as a whole, which is comprised of our, our own CEO, Stefan Rust, and head of product, Oliver Rust. Um, you have Matter Labs, ZK Sync, um, uh, Omar Yahia uh, from the tech side, and of course, um, the former advisor to the Dallas Federal Reserve President, Joseph Tracy, all on the line here. Uh, great chance for you to ask uh, questions. Um, let me throw it back to the panel uh, until I start getting some some questions from our, our listeners here. Um, what what are your thoughts? I, I don't know if if anybody took a stab here yet to say that they don't think rates will raise or not. Uh, can you just kind of give us a thumbs up, thumbs down um, on to whether or not you think they're going to uh, uh, to raise rates today, and um, I, I've got the general gist, but I just want to keep it, you know, short and sweet. Um, Stefan, what do you say? Raise, lower, stay? I think stay. I mean, that's that's you know, I think that's the general consensus. Um, yeah, and I'm sort of, I they're definitely not going to reduce the rates. I just don't believe that. Um, yeah, I mean, the only, and if they want to manage a soft landing, I think they need to see where the market comes out at. Um, squeezing the market for more liquidity, especially after the raising of the debt ceiling, is going to be, um, yeah, and interesting. You're already seeing money markets move their funds out um, in into T-bills. 
um, which is going to take out more money for the market. So I, I just feel, yeah, we're going to see, you know, it stay the same. Uh, Omar, what do you, what, what do you say? Up, down, same. Um, I'm, I'm very careful of, of, uh, trying to predict. Um, but if I, if I had to wager, it would certainly be stay the same. And in fact, allow me to ask one more question to Joseph. Uh, does this mechanically uh, make sense uh, in order for the treasury to get its bill by the end of the year? Do you think that goes into consideration uh, with the open market operation pace of the Fed? So again, um, ideally, the Fed's policy decisions should be independent of treasury funding decisions. Uh, but at the, the same time, uh, the Fed acts as basically the banker for the Treasury and, and runs all the auctions and monitors the Treasury market and uh, obviously would be uh, providing the committee. You know, the markets group makes a report at the very beginning of every FOMC meeting on market conditions, especially in the Treasury market, and talking about you know upcom upcoming funding. Uh, by the Treasury and how they expect those auctions to go. At the same time, as you mentioned, the Fed is also trying to wind down uh, slowly its balance sheet. So the FOMC, when it's making its policy decisions, will be very informed about what are the conditions in funding markets and in particular the Treasury market, especially given that there's going to be a lot of activity, as you say, in that market. And so they can bring that information on board when they're making their policy decisions. Very nice. And we've got a question here from a listener. This is from Let's Go. Um, they write, uh, Oliver, speakers, can you expand a bit more on why the cost of goods is coming down? Are supply chain delays finally getting worked out? Is demand slowing or possibly a change in shipping goods fuel costs? Um, I think we've addressed some of that, but just in case uh, anybody can take it, but Oliver, go ahead. Yeah, the, the main drivers are, are threefold. One is the um, the cost of raw commodity input prices, especially oil. Uh, the last time I looked at the cost of barrel of oil is sitting at around low, high 60s, low 70s. Um, and that's come down dramatically over the last uh, couple of months. So that has been a one, one cost driven. Um, I think there are other logistical supply chain costs. Oh, are you on mute? No, can you hear me? Yeah, we're hearing you just fine. Okay. The um, the second one is more driven by uh, logistical supply chains finally getting ironed out. <clears throat> and um, if you look at inventory stocks in organized in, in in businesses and price of goods, that's coming down as well. Um, and then I think um, the final aspect of it. Uh, it's a lot to do with um, a lot of factors already being priced in. So I think Stefan opened up the comment saying, um, although the consumers are, are, although the rate of inflation is dropping, um, we are still paying more this time, this this time this year than we were this time last year. Although that that rate of increase is much lower, but we're still paying more, and a lot of the um, cost increases that organizations puck, uh, put through um, is already uh, baked in. And so therefore that's coming down. So you're looking at a year and year comparison, which is also feeling that downward trajectory. Yeah. My wife uh, overhears uh, our conversations and she came in a couple of days ago and she said, Hey, trueflation is right. Eggs are down. <laughs> so that's the, uh, that's the indicator for my family. Uh, this week. And it's, again, we talked about it uh, two days ago that inflation is very personal and very specific. Um, so does anybody have any on the panel, anything to add about uh, the price of goods and why they're coming down? Is there anything more to say about that? The only other comment I would add, um, and this is more of a cautionary note, um, is um, as the import duty taxes uh, remain targeted on, yeah, certain sure. product oh. on certain product categories, um, I would be a bit cautious on the future and the outlook to say how that progresses and where that goes. 
right? Because um, as those import duty tax uh, stay high, um, that will result in either organizations and businesses in the U.S. looking to be make their products and goods in the U.S., which might have an increased cost um, onto the consumers. So it's certainly something to be mindful about as, as one looks at this data the next coming months and the remaining part of the year. And Omar, uh, as someone steeped in tech and tech business, um, how much uh, you you sort of spoke to it earlier a little bit uh, with your questions to uh, to Joseph, uh, but how much of the Fed's machinations and their movements impacts what you do um, at a at a business level in in the tech sector? Well, whether whether we like it or not, the uh, Fed at the end of the day dictates the average cost of capital, not just uh, in the United States, but basically around the world. So in fact, it's probably mm -hmm. one of the most, if not the most important factor, uh, because every single enterprise that I look at, I have to ultimately think about uh, the future cash flows that's going to be generated from this enterprise, and I have to discount it appropriately. Okay, And the most important parameter in that calculation is certainly the discount rate, right? I mean, the the opportunity cost for engaging in any particular enterprise uh, in many ways is what can I do uh, with, a sim with a similar level of return, but a much lower level of risk. And typically, uh, because the United States has had the privilege of being the reserve currency uh, of the world, the government of the United States, for the most part, is considered an extremely uh, good uh, debtor. And so everybody is willing to lend to the government of the United States. And to the extent that the Federal Reserve facilitates or inhibits that, it literally changes the risk appetite of investors all around the world. And it, more importantly, it changes the viability of a lot of different business models. So there's this concept that uh, people uh, refer to tongue in cheek, this idea of zero interest rate policy phenomenon or reserve phenomenon. And what typically what they mean by that is a business model or an economic model that thrives only or survives only due to artificially low uh, cost of capital. Okay, so um, whether we like it or not, the way in which we value businesses and the way in which we consider how to join common enterprise and how we ultimately profit from it is all dictated by the cost of capital. So to answer your question very briefly, it is extremely important. Mm. Yeah, and it's uh, that's it's it's interesting to hear it. Uh, put so plainly um, by someone in in the sector because we often think that tech is go go wildcat and they can just you know sort of hot shot around this um, this uh, century old institution. Um, it's interesting. It's just interesting to hear your perspective. Um, and well, I've appreciated the panel. Um, just a fantastic discussion today. Um, we appreciate everybody listening too. Uh, Joseph Tracy, um, you are the man for coming on. And uh, and helping us uh, kind of weed through uh, uh, the murky business of, of the Fed as we see it. Um, really appreciate your time and your trouble. Um, any last words for us? Um, anything you want to say about uh, how we should maybe look at the Fed and kind of view it going going forward? Well, maybe one one last observation. And I mentioned this earlier challenge pre COVID where inflation was trending below. Two uh, percent, and the Fed was trying to to push it up. Is that the challenge in getting uh, reaching that two percent target? Is that service inflation has always exceeded the Fed's target, usually three plus percent. And so, what brought in the overall inflation down, actually a little bit below our target in that earlier period, was deflation in the goods sector. And so the challenge, I think one of the challenges, think about going forward with all the changes going on in the economy that we've talked about and in financial markets is how likely are we to see persistent deflation in goods markets return that will help sort of average down what is usually persistently higher uh, service inflation. And I do see a lot of challenges there. This has been a, uh, a fantastic discussion, and I'm very happy uh, that to, to be invited to participate in this. Great. Really, really, really appreciate it. Um, all right, everybody. Um, thank you so much for, for tuning in. Uh, we will uh, continue this on the other side. Uh, daily, you can keep up with all things Truflation um, on our Twitter account. Uh, Omar, 
uh, how can people uh, keep up with you, follow what you're doing um, in the uh, days and weeks to come here? Uh, well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm quite uh, active on, on Twitter and uh, my profile, you'll see I have a, um, an aggregation of all of the uh, different uh, work and projects that I'm working on at any given time. Um, you can find me on Telegram. If you ping me on, on, on Twitter, we can, you'd like to chat. Um, and then you can follow us at, uh, at Matter Labs. Uh, we're very easy to Google, very easy to find. And uh, if you're interested in uh, all things uh, validity proofs and uh, zero knowledge technology, uh, as well as, I suppose, a little bit of uh, dabbling in macroeconomics, uh, feel free to reach out. Very nice. And you can't let you go without promoting the Uncut <laughs> podcast. Uh, with you and uh, and <laughs> Stefan, uh, which is a weekly. It's hilarious. They they chat about everything from uh, sports and workouts to uh, the daily uh, uh, the daily grind here of just being CEOs in the space. So excellent, um, uh, really great to have you. Um, everybody, uh, do follow uh, Omar and his work. Uh, as you heard, he's uh, one of the sharpest minds uh, we have here. Um, Joseph Tracy, we are, we're going to take full credit, uh, for your, um, baptism into the Twitter world. Uh, we, uh, we made him get a, a Twitter account just so he can, he could speak with us today. So, um, do give Joseph a follow and some love. Um, really brave for coming on and taking all comers and questions. Uh, we do appreciate it, everybody. Um, Joseph, is there anything you want to plug or how people can find you other than your, your new Twitter account? Uh, the only other uh, account I had was LinkedIn, and I do uh, post some of the work that I've been doing and continue to do on, on LinkedIn, but it's been a pleasure to uh, be here with everyone. Great. Thank you again, everybody. Uh, we will archive this um, also on YouTube. That's just Trueflation. You can find us easily if you want to listen again to some of the incredible responses and back and forth, and we will see you next month. Thanks, everyone.